Oh, hallelujah. Uh, uh, tonight, uh, God is. Oh, hallelujah. And uh, there is so much that uh, we can, we're going to explore over the next few weeks. God is. Uh, if you'll stand with me tonight as we go to Psalms 93. And these are some things we'll, f we'll find out that the nature of God is beyond our full comprehension. But what we do know of Him, that God is self-existent, He is transcendent, God is sovereign, God is omniscient, God is almighty, God is a resource of comfort and praise. These are some things that we know about his character that God is. Uh, and John, a little John, 1 John, says God is love. One of the first scriptures, verses that I remember memorizing in Sunday school. But then later on I grew up and uh, realized that's not the whole scripture verse. You know, you know little children, you know, little children, and then it goes on to about the little children. And yes, God is love. Psalm 93. The Lord reigneth. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. Wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up her voice. The floods lifted up their waves. The Lord on high is mightier than the noise of many waters. Yea, than the mighty waves of the sea. Thy testimonies are very sure. Holiness becometh thine house, O Lord, forever. Psalm 90 and verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thought hath formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And let's lift our hands and our voices tonight. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, we thank you so much for your presence and thank you, Lord, for who you are. God, we love you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, your majesty rules and reigns in our hearts and our lives. Oh, God, we worship you in the beauty of your holiness. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. Mighty God, mighty God, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you, you may be seated. Uh, frequently, when individuals attempt to describe God, they slip into the use of philosophical definitions or terminologies uh, rather than scriptural language. Uh, someone has described theology as the intersection of philosophy and scripture. Philosophical considerations often tend to overwhelm scripture. I see that this is the reason why the Apostle Paul uh, warned against the deceptiveness of philosophy in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. Uh, we are limited in our understanding of God and by those limitations of the human language when we talk about how great God is. How do we describe that? Well, like little Lady Clara that sang this morning, that we describe Him as bigger than the mountain, wider than the ocean, and yet, how did the psalmist David describe God? 
you know, the mighty waves, the great waves, you know, of the sea. So we are limited in our descriptive language. Uh, there are no words that are sufficient to fully and accurately describe the magnificence of our Lord. Here we sing this chorus. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is He. But yet, we, we are limited to you. In our finite mind, we imagine things which are so minute when in comparison of uh, the greatness of our God. You know, some of the greatest wonders of the world, when you think about in monetary, monetary sense, the Taj Mahal that was built for this king's lover, his wife, when it was erected, you know, years and years ago, it was millions of dollars and millions of dollars of marble that went into that monument. And yet, God is greater than the Taj Mahal. Right. You know, we, we think of Mount Everest, you know, how vast it is and, and people that's attempted and that has made that attempt to go, climb to the top to be on the very top of Mount Everest to overlook whatever is down below. Snow-covered other mountainsides. They look down to where they've come from. Just the, you know, just the fact that in history their name is recorded as climbing to the very top of Mount Everest. Then we think of Mount Rushmore, one of our historical landmarks, where somebody so bravely you know, scaled the side of that and carved faces of our presidents into that solid granite. And yet, you know, those are just so small in size and how great our God is, and yet we kind of use these things in comparison. When we think about the everlasting love of our God and unfailing love, you know, sometimes we revert back to something that they call old faithful that's sometimes not as faithful as she once was. But in Yellowstone National Park, that geyser that shoots up used to be every faithful every hour, whether she's still on the hour or not. But, but that's something that's faithful. It's you know, steadfast. You know, we equate faithfulness or steadfastness with the rock of Gibraltar. You know, even yes. an insurance company, they use that as their insignia as a, you know, we're here forever. We're, yes. you know, we're strong. But we see that God has revealed many things about himself. But we can only perceive what we can describe. And can describe only what our language can encompass. Uh, we are further limited by the scope of human ability to understand language itself. You know, some people have great command of the English language. You know, they can pull out these yardstick words and they know what they mean. And others just get by on, what, three-letter words. And if they have to think of a five-letter or seven-letter word, their brain goes in immediate shutdown. Uh, Sister Sandra, I, I like to play Scrabble. Sister Talbot likes to play Scrabble. But uh, Sister Sandra does not. Uh, there is a word that is close to Scrabble that she enjoys playing because, here again, you don't have to think of the five letters or seven letters and try to unscramble this. It's a, word, it's a game that you play, you can use three letters, four letters. All you have to do is take one letter and you can change the whole root of different letters to make different words by do, using one letter. She doesn't like me to play with her when we play upwards because I like to look at that board and it's like if there's a word that goes this way and there's a word that goes this way can I and another word that goes this way can I fill in the, that space between and make you know about four different words right there because once I do that she can't change any of that She's got to branch out with another word somewhere on the board. 
And, uh, but you know, language becomes a barrier to, barrier to us. Trying to comprehend and describe God is, in, is comparable to a person trying to pour five gallons of liquid into a half pint container. Uh, one could get the essence of a whole, but never encompass it totally. Uh, since humanity is incapable of comprehending or dis even describing God in his fullness, God has revealed himself to us. And, and I thought about the song, Sister uh, Alicia, led us tonight. The mighty God is Jesus. The Prince of Peace is He. The living Word incarnate. The helpless sinners. Oh, hallelujah. And yet, it's all in Him. The fullness of the Godhead. Oh, hallelujah. Embodies Him fully, head to toe. Fingertip to fingertip. By his revelation, he has let us know the proper way to approach him and how to relate to his ways. Yes, amen. Praise and the Lord. God is self-existent. Yes, amen. People try to, once again, in their finite mind, try to draw a timeline because that's what we do. Uh, go to the cemetery, a great place to look at timelines. Born 1878, died 1902. That was a timeline for him. Born 19 or 1897, died 2011. A timeline for them. Uh, I was just looking at the paper the other day at work. To, it kind of scanned over the, on the front page. It had a woman picture. She was 110 years old. And uh, she, they had celebrated her birthday. She had passed. So you figure, here it is. She must have been born about 1901. And this is our 19, because uh, I think the, she celebrated her birthday a year ago. But anyway, uh, so whether it's born in 1901 or 1902, a long time, but that's a timeline. That's how we, you know, look at somebody's life by a timeline. We look at our country even by a timeline. You know, some people started at 1775. Others start the timeline at 1776. Uh, others can start at about 1770 because there was a transitional period between 17. 70 to 1775. But when we look at the, the signing of the document, uh, you know, we always revert back to our birth date as the year of 1776. And a lot of people say that President uh, George Washington was our first president, but he wasn't. Does anybody know who the first president was? Well, actually, see, there, the, there was a president of the uh, Congress, or the United States Congress, before it became the United States of America, which, yes, George Washington was the first president of the uh, United States. But so there again, where you make your beginning, or you mark your beginning. So because of that, People say, well, where did God start? Where is God's beginning? He's got to have a beginning. But we go to the Word, and the Word says, He was before a beginning. He was in the beginning, and even before the beginning. So in His essence, God has always been. When God revealed Himself to Moses at the burning bush, He, dis he identified Him as what? The I am. I am the I am. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. 
the de designation for God encompasses the idea of God existing eternally and without creation by another. He is the self-existing one. Time means nothing to him because right. he created time right. and before time there was no time so what did he worry or why was he consumed with time? That's right. We human beings are the only one that is consumed about time. That's right. Glory. 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 Uh, the other night in a meeting uh, I made a comment that was later on I got a little reprimanded for by my wife. She said it was a little random. Uh, I know where you're coming from, but I think everybody else sitting in the room kind of wondered where that came from. And uh, in a certain book that uh, I have, it says that 70% of American people are in debt. 55% of those 70% that's in debt uh, worry. You know, they, they worry about their debt. 15% of them must be asleep. And uh, so in this uh, setting, uh, it was in response to a question that was on the overhead. And I said, I must be part of that 15% asleep. And the instructor said, you want to add anything else to that? I said, no, I mean, it's just basically a blank sense. So that means that the other people in that class did not read their book, or they were sitting there asleep. But anyway, Sister Sanders said, well, you know, he probably thought that if he didn't move on with the class, I'm gonna go to sleep. But it wasn't anything about that. It's just like, so so random, but. Because we're consistent about, we think about time, time management, you know, uh, utilizing your time, using your time wisely. Even the Apostle Paul was consumed about time. What, did he, what time statement did he make? Very timely. Redeeming the time for the days are evil. So we all need to be time conscious about things that we're doing or not doing. What things we should be doing that we're not doing or things that we are doing that we shouldn't be doing. Uh, God is the uncreated first cause. He is neither created nor uh, by, created by, nor derived from any prior existence. He is the answer to the question, where did everything come from? <laughs> you know, a, a child will ask you, where did I come from? Guess what mommy says? You came from my tummy. Yeah, that, that really answers a lot of questions. But I know for the sake of parenting, parents don't want to have to get involved with all the detail. Some say, oh honey, you, you are a created being of love. A love of daddy and mommy and we produced you. Now we brought other questions. And yet, you know, we, we look at oil. Where did this come from? Well, it depends on the type of oil. If it's olive oil, they took olive berries, crushed them, and, and they made the oil. Or if it's made from, you know, frankincense or myrrh, it's, they, they've taken that bark and they squished it and got the oil through the process to make the oil. And yet, all of that doesn't always satisfy until you take them to the plant producing uh, and watch them do, make the, uh, go through the whole process. But when we talk about God, where did he come from? Even in science, they say, okay, the beginning of the earth began. Well, if you're set in a, in a Christian uh, science class, they begin to say, it all happened in the beginning. If you'll turn to your Bibles and your textbook to Genesis chapter 1, and we're in chapter 3, and you will look here at what the Bible says according to what our textbook says. 
But if you're sitting in a sacred classroom, they're going to say, well, you see, many millions or billions years ago, there was a big explosion. Kaboom! There was a, colli a collision out in outer space and all this matter was whirling around and, and it began to collapse and, and yet so you have this great big thing. Blah. You know, it's called the Big Bang Theory. But see, like others, they like to presuppose the existence of something in the beginning to explain all things that exist. Whatever the me mechanics of creation have been, God is self-existent beginning from all those things. In Psalm uh, 90, in verse 2, says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thought has formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting. Thou art God. As creatures of time, we're bound by strictures of time. Uh, it is practically impossible for an individual even to conceive of the idea of eternity. You know, how in your mind, how has eternity been described to you? Think of the different ways time and eternity has been equated. A bird flying from the moon to the sand, you know, down in Florida. Taking a grain of sand and flying to the moon. And back again. And he's emptied all the sand. Eternity is just again. Or they talk about a big steel ball, and the, the bird flies past the steel ball with his wings. And I know the steel does it uh, etch very well. But they said through time, that bird will, that constant rubbing will put a little denture into the, the steel. And they said, time. Just eternity has just begun. Right. Uh, mankind's own experiences and lifespan tend to control and limit his uh, personal concept of the duration of time. Uh, he may intellectually, uh, intellectually uh, grasp the idea of time uh, in millennium, uh, but his real perception is more in the idea of the timeline that I just described earlier. But God, on the other hand, is not bound by time because he created it. He designed it with n n nothing or with neither a beginning or an ending. He neither ages nor does he change. My God doesn't get old. Just right. human beings get old. Right. My God never changes. Just human nature changes. My God never sleeps nor slumbers, but he is ever watching over us. We see that God is self-revealing. In Romans chapter 1, verse 19 and verse 20, it says, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so they are without excuse through the centuries mankind has devised all manner of ideas concerning the nature of God. Uh, usually the concepts are individuals uh, were at best screwed with uh, more often than not, they were absolutely wrong. Right. But God has revealed himself through nature. Yes. God has revealed himself through theophanies. Right. Uh, the, he's revealed himself through the written word. Right. Hallelujah. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was God. 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Verse 2, the same was it, the same in the beginning was God. And so we see that uh, God, through the written Word, through incarnation, and the infilling of His Spirit has been self-revealing to nature and mankind. We see that God is self-sustaining. And in closing tonight, in Psalm 50 and verse 12 says, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. So why would God stoop down to say, why don't you fix me something to eat? I'm hungry. The other night, little Clara came to me and she said, Papa, I'm hungry. And I know it was kind of being a little, trying to be diverse from what she was supposed to do, like go to bed. And uh, she'd be talking to me and she said, hear that? And I didn't hear anything. I said, what was it? That was my tummy. It's telling me I'm hungry. You know, uh, it's kind of hard not to get up and make some peanut butter crackers, you know. <laughs> but I consoled her and told her, I said, well, I know one thing. When you go to sleep in the morning, your mama will feed you. Your mama will give you, fix your breakfast. But I've never heard God say, I'm hungry, feed me, give me something to eat. Now I know that I've heard him say to me, in a sense of uh, figuratively speaking, I'm hungry, but it wasn't for food. He was hungry for fellowship. He creates us so that we could be in fellowship with him. So if he ever speaks to you and say, Sister Carolyn, I'm hungry, he's telling you, sit down with him and his word. Let him talk to you. Let him speak to you. But we see that God does not need anyone or anything. We are the one that need him. If any of us are going to be hungry for more of God, it's us. We are the ones that said, we should be saying, God, I need more of you. Will you take a little bit of your time to sit down and talk with me, commune with me? See, God is the creator and he's the owner of everything. There is nothing that an individual or an individual can do to add to him. We can't make him any greater and neither can we make him any less than what he is. He's the best thing that ever happened to any of us tonight. That's right. Further, if he had a need, don't you think he is futile enough not to ask assistance from us that he's able to do it on his own? I don't think he had a woman there to tell him how to create the world. Nor was Adam there either to say, you know what, I think you could have done it better if you... That's why he put everything in place, everything in order before he made man. Because he didn't need us. But it was to show the fact that he still doesn't need us. Just think about it. When you flip over to about the sixth chapter of Genesis, and he repented that he made man, what was he about to do? He was about to destroy the, not just a few people, but he was destroy, He was willing to destroy the whole world because he didn't need any of them, and he, did not, he certainly didn't need any other stinking set. But there was a righteous man in his family, and he was willing to save them and not destroy the whole world. Just think about Sodom and Gomorrah and their stupid sinning. And he was going to destroy them, but he would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah from destruction 
just because of one righteous man's plea, will you save it for ten righteous souls? And God said, yes. But we see that he didn't need Sodom and Gomorrah, and he didn't need the world uh, after it went so corrupt. Anything we could provide him is already his. And it's already his for his taking and his using. So when, when you think in the terms of dollars and cents or minutes, seconds, and hours, there is nothing that we can give of our time or of our substance that doesn't really already belong to him. When you, when you put it on the bottom line, it's not about us. In our perspective, it's not about us. But it is all about Him. And who He is. And the relationship that He wants to have with each one of His children. God is self-revealing. God is self-sustaining. And God is eternal. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Let's all stand tonight and let's just lift our hands and let's magnify the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Let's worship Him for who He is.